Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Engineering the Olympics and Paralympics Smart Traffic Solution. My name is Megan Purdy and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to Elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the partners of the Engineering the Olympics and Paralympics series, AMAG, Arab, Oricon, Bluebeam, GHD and SMEG. Now today we'll hear from three speakers followed by our live audience Q&A. So I encourage you all to please send your questions through to our speakers via the chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Andrew Painter. Andrew is a technology executive with broad experience across multiple business domains and technologies. Andrew believes that a customer-centric approach and empowered team culture is crucial to success and that the critical application of technology becomes the enabler of a successful strategy and takes a pragmatic, outcome-driven approach to deliver results that make significant contribution to revenue growth and profitability. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Painter. Thanks, Megan, for that introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Painter. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Transmax, and I'm responsible for the product development of Transmax's ITS platform called Streams. So today I would like to share with you how Transmax, through our Streams Next Generation program and product roadmap, is engineering the future of mobility and providing smart traffic solutions that will prepare Brisbane for the Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2032. So firstly, who is Transmax? Transmax is a private company owned by the Queensland Department of Transport and Main Roads. Our major product is Streams, an integrated intelligent transport systems platform. An ITS platform allows road owners and operators to manage and optimize their road networks by connecting multiple roadside devices like traffic lights, uh, speed notifications, and message signs. Transmax's customers include most of the Australian state road authorities and also private motorway operators. The Streams ITS platform includes a broad range of modules that support road operations and device integration and management. These modules include motorway management, arterials management, which manages signals across uh, corridors and arterials, emergency vehicle priority, travel information, CCTV integration, systems integration, and heavy vehicle management. And this is a picture of streams as, as it is now. To build the future for smart traffic solutions, Transmax is embarking on an ambitious program to reimagine streams for the future. Streams Next Gen is a reimagining the intelligent transport systems for safer, more reliable and sustainable road networks. The principles that guide the next gen development help position the platform to meet evolving needs around new capabilities, new data sources and new approaches. The next gen platform will allow new capabilities to be developed and deployed quickly. Technology and development processes will allow Transmax to pivot quickly to meet emerging mobility needs and support innovation. In addition to the technological changes, the manner in which NextGen Platform is built relies on empowered product team approach. This approach and mindset supports the guiding principles and allows the organisation to deliver faster, innovate and pivot rapidly as required. The implementation of the NextGen Streams Platform develops on these principles. So new ways of collaborating between teams and with customers provides incremental and regular delivery of value, fast feedback loops and agility to respond to emerging needs and opportunities. Improved user experience with a unified user experience design system with data-driven, analytical, insightful 
predictive and proactive browser-developed web applications. A contemporary architecture and technology stack provides new levels of data security and privacy and system resilience, availability, scalability, usability, and openness. And cloud-native industry standards, which support highly available and elastic applications, leveraging significant automation with minimal downtime deployments and in-service monitoring. Best practice information security and privacy provided via an ISO 27001 aligned information security management system, providing defense in depth across infrastructure, platform, and layers, including user security, which includes authentication, authorization, and management. And highly available platform services. These are provided using a microservices framework real-time service bus and data repository, historical data repository, and web application technologies, and minimal downtime employments, supporting the frequent and incremental upgrades, which minimize disruption to operations. So uh, some of the Stream's next-gen applications are already in use. So TMR is hosting the Stream's Common Operational View, which I'll be able to provide a demonstration of uh, at the end of the presentation, and Stream's Disruption Management, and other in-development products. The Stream's next-gen platform supports the development of application solutions that will provide transport, network intelligence, optimization, incident verification, disruption management. Using data insights, information can be used for a range of applications, including predictive analytics and network performance measurement for real-time response, or forward planning by the transport agency. I would now like to take the opportunity to talk about two applications that have been developed on Streams Next Gen and are currently being used by our customers to optimize traffic flow and network performance. The Smart Motorways application provides real-time management and optimization of traffic flow on motorways and freeways. Real-time interventions can be made using devices along the freeway mainline, for example, to change speed limits dynamically or to inform vehicle drivers of changed lane conditions and to provide relevant information to drivers. Freeway congestion occurs when traffic flow breaks down into a chaotic state. Common cause of flow breakdown occurs when merging traffic enters a motorway. Changes in speed and lane changes near intersection merge points lead to flow breakdown and congestion. If you've ever been caught in a major motorway congestion, you may have noticed that it's heaviest when approaching an intersection with merging traffic. The Stream Smart Motorways coordinated and adaptive ramp metering solution controls the entry of merging traffic to match the capacity of the motorway. As a result, congestion is avoided for longer and travel time is reduced for commuters and mobility services that use the motorway. This is an example of coordinated and adaptive ramp metering in action and the various parameters that the ramp metering optimizes in real time. So the ramp metering is attempting to break up the tunes coming in from the arterial network. And it's also adjusting the entry flows based on the capacity of the motorway in real time. The algorithms used can find the moving bottleneck locations and calculate the dynamic capacity of those groups of traffic. So what the algorithm is attempting to do is balance the workload and queue length across all the available ramps. Smart Motorways has now been installed in Melbourne, Perth, and on the Bruce Highway north of Brisbane. These are the benefits as measured along the Monash Freeway in Melbourne. An improvement in safety with a reduction in accidents, 30%. Travel time reduced by up to 42% during peak periods. Sustainability improvements with an estimated reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of 11%. And an overall estimated societal economic impact of $2 million per day in terms of improved safety, travel time, and sustainability. 
these are real measurable improvements and in terms of managing traffic during the Olympics, smart motorways and coordinated and adaptive ramp metering will help ease congestions between the various event locations. The Olympic Games venues will be held in venues across southeast Queensland, which apart from the rail link connection between Brisbane and the Gold Coast, will have their transport connection needs served primarily through existing motorways. The stream's common operational view. While smart motorways provides real-time optimization at the level of motorway corridor to provide a network level or a network-wide optimization, this starts with network-wide situational awareness. The stream's common operational view is a network-wide intelligent real-time situational awareness tool that provides multimodal transport network visibility by identify, identifying and comprehending and creating network intelligence for transport operators and network management. Situational awareness is not complete without a full understanding of the state of the network in real time. This includes travel time and congestion information. Also the state of roadside devices and multimodal service information, including late running services and incident management information. Network wide situational awareness provides the ability to respond with the full context to incidents as they unfold. Disruptions can be managed more effectively as relevant data and actions are made available to roadside operations. By providing situational awareness and advanced applications with the NextGen Streams platform, Transmax will be helping Queensland deliver a safe and efficient transport service for the Brisbane Olympic and Paralympic Games. With tools to optimise and manage road networks in real time, and to provide TMR's road network management and optimization organization the insights required to make the games experience a success. It's going to be an awesome journey. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Andrew, for your input. I'd now, I would now like to welcome our second speaker, Dr. Simon Washington. Simon is the co-founder and CEO of Advanced Mobility Analytics Group based in Brisbane and has held positions at renowned engineering universities, including the University of California, Berkeley, Georgia Institute of Technology, University of Queensland, Arizona State University, University of Arizona, and Queensland University of Technology. His contributions include co-authoring over 150 peer-reviewed articles, authoring a widely adopted textbook now in its third edition across 20 countries, and editing two additional books. Please join me in welcoming Simon Washington. Thank you, Megan, for the intro. Hello, everyone. I'm Simon Washington, Managing Director and Co-Founder of Advanced Mobility Analytics Group. Um, thank you, Engineers Australia, for the opportunity to speak today about delivering a safe Paralympic and Olympic Games. Um, I'm going to jump right in. Um, the talking points that I'll cover today are really some of the, the opportunities and challenges uh, that, that will arise from the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Uh, I'll then talk a little bit about uh, AMEC, very, very little, just to give uh, people, the audience, uh, uh, an overview of the company, what we do, uh, and then how we're focused on safety. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how our AI and our conflict analytics work and the history of developing this this technology for delivering safer outcomes. Uh, and then I'll, I'll talk about uh, sort of safety management opportunities, um, making traffic operations safer. Uh, so the management and operations functions of DOTs. And then um, case studies will be covered by Jason Deller in the uh, following presentation. So when I think about the, the you know our company and, and our, our focus on road safety and the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games, um, I've I've kind of thought about how we can contribute in, in our technology and, and I am focused on what we can do as a company. Um, there there are certainly lots of challenges and opportunities outside of the things that we can tackle, but I'm, I am interested on on, on AMAG as a safety company and other companies like AMAG that that can help to deliver a safer Olympic and Paralympic Games. 
uh, the things that came up in my mind are, um, and, and I have to share with everyone, I, I have lived through a city I, um, that, that offered the Olympic Games. I was in Atlanta in 1996 uh, that hosted the Olympic Games. And, and I did get, get the great opportunity to live through a city, um, live in a city that, that uh, went through the Olympic Games. And it was quite a remarkable experience. Uh, and, and, uh, and I, you know, was there at, at Georgia Tech at the time uh, as a, a assistant professor in, in transportation. And, uh, and I, I did get to look at the impact on the transportation system and the other effects that were happening there. So I, I do have some firsthand experience um, having lived through, through a, a city that hosted the games. Um, there's probably more, more impactful than the games itself is going to be the lead up to uh, uh, the, the next decade of construction that we're going to see in, in, in and around Brisbane uh, in the lead up to the games. And, and, you know, work zones are a very high priority to keep people safe. Uh, the workers in work zones, as well as the motoring public, um, active travelers are in and around work zones. So um, that, that's, a, that's a, um, an opportunity that will span over the next decade, not just um, the few weeks of the Olympic Games. Uh, and probably, you know, from a, from a safety standpoint, probably far more significant than we might expect from the games themselves. Um, during the games, there's going to be a large influx of non-local drivers. I remember being in Atlanta and seeing the, um, the uh, road signs go up that were in, at the time in French uh, and English uh, and for, for the, the visitors to the games. And, and we're, we're going to, you know, as you know, we have a lot of people coming uh, that are not used to our roads, not used to the, our sides of the road um, and driving, uh, you know, rental cars and other um, other means of transport, as well as a lot of um, active travelers. And as we know from experience in Australia, people coming from countries that, that drive on uh, the other side of the road, also as pedestrians have very different behaviors in anticipating traffic. And um, these are gonna present some, some interesting challenges for us in the Olympic games. Um, and of course, then there's gonna be the games themselves that uh, will have a massive impact on the on on the transport network potentially and i and i say that because having lived through atlanta there was there was a fair amount of hysteria uh, leading up to the games about uh the the road network getting being more congested than it had ever seen um prior to the olympic games with all the all the visitors in in the uh coming to atlanta and it turned out to be the exact opposite it was the lightest traffic um, that anyone had seen in a long time, and the the there was a lot of surprise about that because um, you know the locals and the residents stayed far away from from the venues and the games and planned holidays away and things like this. So it'll be an interesting uh, uh, to to see a second data point here in Brisbane. Um, but there will be a lot of traffic. There'll be particularly a lot of um, active travelers that will be using uh, parts of the network and the venues and going to and from the venues, the last mile kind of activities, and a lot of new transit vehicles and, and other service vehicles that will be on the roads that we don't normally see. So a, a large amount of non what would they call non-normal travel behavior. Um, and, and as we know, as transport planners and managers and operators, um, dealing with non-normal travel behavior is <clears throat> always a more challenging Thing than when we when we know we see what we expect to see, so it'll be interesting. So just a little bit about AMAG, as I as I mentioned, we we are a company focused on um, artificial, you know, providing safer uh, streets for all road users. We we did pioneer the use of video analytics. So I'm one of our co-founders with Tarak Syed, who. Who built this technology started working on this video analytics and safety in, in 2005 um, and uh, and we, we spent a lot of time developing the metrics that we can measure to uh, that are help us to to measure critical conflicts and near misses and and our focus the AMAC focus is to be a, a leading industry provider of, of AI led predictive analytics and insights Um, so, what we do as a company, just to, to, to let you know um, what we're focused on, is we ingest video or LiDAR data. Typically, um, most of our, our ingestion now is in the video space. Um, but we, we um, so video being 
um, processed optics um, and LIDAR being 3D point cloud um, representations of, of a road. We ingest that through uh, an AI and then that AI, um, we add layers of, of information to that AI um, and metadata and then provide that back to our customers through a variety of products. And, and the, the, the intent really is to provide um, insight to uh, road safety, um, both the managers and the operators to um, deliver safer transport systems in the Paralympic and Olympic Games, with no exception. Um, just a customer snapshot, um, we're, we're in six countries and, and, um, and most active in Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and we a couple of countries in the Middle East. Um, just a couple of comments from some of our customers uh, and you know talking about our technology and I think the, mo the most important um, reflection we've had from our customers is that um, the, the technology, the video analytics technology with AI uh, is really the only pathway to vision zero and I'll, I'll explain that in more detail later. But I mean, it's really important to understand that we, we can't get to where we need to be with, with crashes um, and, and using crash data to inform us. Just a few go to market partners where um, we, we do have a very strong relationship with Amazon Web Services. All of our products are, are hosted in, in AWS Cloud. We deploy our real time solution in AWS Panorama Edge device. Um, and we've got a lot of go-to go-to-market partners to help us um, deliver solutions to customers. So we rarely go direct to, to, to clients. We do sometimes, but we, uh, you know, our preferred approach is to deliver end-to-end -end solutions with a number of partners. So our the technology of video analytics and how they can make uh, you know Olympic Games and Paralympic Games safer and and transport systems safer in general. Um, stems from some very early work that was done, um, uh, started, like I said, in 2005. And my apologies to anyone in the audience that, that, has already, that already knows about this, um, this technology, but I, I need to, to cover it just in case there are those that, that haven't seen this before. But the real, the real breakthrough was that the discovery that, um, first of all, the reliance on crashes, which represents a very small percentage of all outcomes um, on our networks. Um, is quite unreliable for a variety of reasons. But probably most importantly is that uh, crashes are too late. And so if we rely on crashes to, to inform us about how to prevent future crashes, we can never get to the point where we, we're eliminating crashes before they happen. And that's the only way we can get to a vision zero. So we have to be proactive and, and using crash data does not allow or enable us to be proactive. So, um, so we spent a lot of time investigating what kinds of things we could measure. And I'll show you a few of those things in a minute. Um, but it's really about the critical conflicts. Uh, those sets of actions that we can objectively measure, or interactions, I should say, on, on the road network that predict future outcomes um, being crashes. And what I like to share with customers is in thinking about this, is that really what this does is it, if, if we can measure one thing um, at a location that pre that's the most reliable predictor of future crash events, it would be measuring critical conflicts. And this replaces decades of only measuring exposure at a site to, as the best predictor of crash, future crashes. And, and all of our models and all of the the methods and techniques we've used over the last decades essentially use exposure to predict uh, future crashes. And it's insufficient because exposure is not enough information to pinpoint uh, when, where, and how um, risk is actually unfolding. And I'll give you a sense of that as we go forward. So the early proving grounds uh, was we're, and there's now there's now hundreds of studies that have that have done this, but just to kind of illustrate how this this technology was was um, validated, uh, this was a, a set of sites, three three locations in Canada, where the customer uh, 
installed a, a slip lane with a, a lower approach angle to the main line. And then the focus was on giving greater visibility to the entering motorist. And also they, they, they provided an approved pedestrian uh, access across the, the slip lane at the same time. And what we did um, is went in and measured conf critical conflicts before and after these treatments were applied and also measured the safety impacts. And what you see here um, uh, on the left is, is a, are curves of the rear end merging conflicts and total conflicts before and after, the before being blue. Uh, and you can see a, a, just across the board reduction uh, in, in risk or conflicts. Uh, on the right hand side, you see in the table, you see in the, in the far right, um, oh, my, my apologies, this has been translated and I haven't <laughs> translated back. The far right shows the actual accidents, um, that the accident reduction. So the first site showed a 34% uh, reduction in crashes um, from the before to after. The middle column shows the reduction in conflict. So we measured and you can see almost correlate, correlated uh, relationship between the reduction in conflicts from before to after um, and the crashes. So um, we, uh, the way we measure that, that information and this, the conflicts is there's a number of measures we use, but um, they're, they're quite objectively measured. And, we, and this is where video analytics and AI come in to, to be very helpful. Uh, but we measure these, the time to collision um, as the, the, the time distance um, from two road users uh, before an actual conflict or, or collision. Uh, and we measure the minimum time to, to collision of two road users. So in most interactions, one or more road users will change direction or speed and no longer be on a, on a collision course. And at that moment, we measure how close they were to an actual collision. And generally, the research uh, suggests and supports in Western countries that any uh, time to collision less than 1.5 seconds is a very reliable predictor of future crashes of that type of conflict. So for example, if you have a rear end conflict uh, that, that show up um, at, uh, repeatedly at a location, then, then uh, it's a very reliable predictor of future rear end crashes. And so we have various measures on the bottom. We have, I'll, I'll talk to you about um, Delta V. That's, that's a measure of the essential mass or the, the, the differential speed and mass and angle uh, that would be involved in predicting severity of a crash. So we can measure that in, at the conflict, the minimum conflict point. And we use that to determine what, what the likelihood of a, a crash being severe would be. Uh, and we found, and, and again, the research has shown that this metric is very reliable to help us understand that kind of um, work. So at, at the heart of um, all of the, the analytics is a, an AI engine. Um, and the, the, this is the core, or this beginning, the fundamental building blocks of any AI platform um, or analytic, video analytics platform. And what you can see here are um, scooters being, being detected, pedestrians, um, vehicles. Uh, and, and even in this, we're detecting uh, helmet uh, use uh, with very, very high reliability. One of the things we know from our customers is that um, the, the, the objective of this kind of, of analytics is to replace other sources of information like loop detectors. And so we know that they need to be very accurate. We know we need to build models that, that work very, very reliably. And this is um, a constant uh, focus of ours. And we spend a lot of, of effort making sure this is the case. So our AI is currently trained to detect a number of different road users. This, this uh, diagram shows the road users that we currently have in our AI system. Uh, so there's 13 classes and including e-scooters um, because e-scooters are showing up more and more and more of our customers 
are concerned about e-scooters and, and how they're getting involved in uh, particular incidents and accidents on, on roads. We spent a lot of time focused on accuracy, and this has been an evolution. Um, you know, first it's getting the technology working, and and then you quickly realize that um, you, you have to focus on on accuracy and um, validation. So over the last two years, AMAG has taken a huge focus on on validation and and the accuracy of all of our analytics. And so we go through a six point process to make sure that we deliver. Um, very reliable analytics because if if um, if the the flows and speeds and detections aren't working well, then all of your downstream analytics aren't going to be um, very reliable either. So just to give you a sense of, um, I'll, I'll give you I'll come back and show you a sense of uh, 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 sort of an example of how um, we do that those validations. So the um, what what we're providing to customers a lot of times are um, these critical conflicts, we measure them. So you can see we 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 detect when, say, pedestrians are are running across a um, uh, uh, traffic location and, and getting in a conflict with a car. Sometimes when when customers see something like I just showed you, uh, they'll ask the question, "Well, that doesn't look like they almost got killed." And it turns out that that that's not necessary. It's not necessary that um, someone is uh, almost killed in, in a near miss. What's necessary is, is that we see a pattern of near miss behavior like that, and, and that's what is the reliable predictor of future crashes. And so when, you, when we look at those kinds of conflicts, we have to remember that um, in this case, no one was killed, but, but if you played that scenario out over and over again, and if pedestrians are continually running um, against the light, uh, jaywalking at that location, you will get a situation where uh, a driver doesn't notice them and um, and changes lane at the right time and, and do just doesn't see them. They're looking down in their, at their phone or they're uh, looking, talking to their passenger or they're doing something else. And that's the fact that you have that repeated behavior is where the risk um, comes in. And almost all of these critical conflicts um, when you play them out over and over again, even in a, a thought exercise, you can you can quickly understand why it is a risk, and that's that's why we um, focus on those events. Um, you know, we we need to track all the users in the scene, and and that's that's a typical um, kind of um, engine that drives all of the, the, the downstream am analytics. So from something like this, we can we can get road position, we can get speed. Um, and all of the, the conflicts that, that are, are happening in, in, in the scene. And you can see there's just, just a wealth of information. And when you compare this to what is traditionally available at a location like this, say loop detectors, um, the, the amount of information is, is just staggeringly more, more complete uh, and more informative for, to, for measuring and understanding risk. And we can do the same thing on, on shared paths um, as well as in as on um, uh, motorways, and uh, and and we we have a lot of customers that um, that get complaints about how uh, shared paths are being used and and the risks that they're seeing on shared paths with particularly with electrified uh, mobility, uh, micro mobility. So we have differential speeds that we didn't used to see on shared use paths, and and there's a lot of concern about. Um, what do we what do we do as an agency um, in a policy setting uh, and a signage and striping and, and other things to deal with the the complaints we're getting and say some of the injuries that we're getting? Um, so this is a this is a, a video also showing our um, our real time safety product and and so we're we're also focused on and how do we manage safety and risk in real time? And what we're doing with this product and our edge device is detecting the presence of pedestrians, um, jaywalkers. Um, and we can use that information to communicate with ITS devices like uh, traffic signal controllers, flashing beacons, and other, other devices. I'll show you a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. Um, so this is just an, an idea of um, a site assessment that we've done. 
Um, and and uh, and what we do is we we look at and, and count all the the accuracy of all of the the road user movements by direction, and we do this um, manually and compare this to the AI on a routine basis for our customers to show um, where where any deficiencies might be in a in a camera setup, uh, and and also to to show that how how um, that we've achieved certain minimums in terms of accuracy. We're always striving for above 90%, um, often achieve much higher than 95%. And when we don't, we, we usually understand, try to understand that and, and, and figure out what, what you know, is wrong with the camera. There might be a blockage of a camera, like a signal head um, or an incomplete view of an, a crossing or something like that. Um, but these are examples of, of um, independent validations of our AI to make sure that all our analytics are performing well. And really what this amounts to is when we, we take um, analytics, AI, machine learning, and uh, video analytics and put them um, um, and you know, provide, provide these to customers, what we're really doing is changing from this right-hand side of reactive safety approach um, to a proactive safety one. Um, we're, we're not relying on, on crashes to inform us about decisions, but, but uh, critical conflicts. And this is the transition that, that has to occur, that needs to occur for us to achieve the, the vision zero targets that we're, we're striving for as a, as a, um, as a world and a, a collective um, nations all striving to achieve vision zero. And there are all kinds of reasons why this transition is, is good, um, including the, the lack of accuracy of, of crash data, reliability of crash data, um, the incompleteness of information that you get from crash data compared to um, the completeness that you get from critical conflicts. Um, I won't go through all these use cases. Jason Deller is gonna, has followed up, he's gonna focus on the use cases of, of this kind of um, technology and what customers value propositions they're getting. Um, but there, there are use, a, a whole bunch of really use, um, valuable use cases in the real-time management uh, uh, of safety as well as the, the the more traditional safety management that is black spot treatment um, evaluations and um, those kinds of uh, prospective studies of safety and the the real value is that you the insight you get with the conflicts is just far beyond what you could ever um, get from traditional sensors and um, it's far more objective than some of the other things like roadside safety audits, which are very valuable. And um, um, but but uh, roadside sa safety audits, for example, you, you might you wouldn't collect information about specific movements of road users. And uh, in in with video analytics, you can collect a week of twenty four seven um, week of information or continuously and get continuous information about the operation of a location. So it's it goes far beyond what you get from a roadside safety audit. Um, just very quickly, I'll, I'll let Jason Deller go more, far more into these, but their, their use cases are um, like um, treatments before after studies. This is a study by one of our customers in, in the United States looking at uh, high visibility crosswalks and seeing a 56% reduction in pedestrian involved conflicts by putting in these high visibility crosswalks. And we can determine that very quickly with, with video analytics. Um, we have here another case in Washington, D.C., where there was a, a merged lane uh, uh, that was causing uh, a number of sideswap related crashes uh, based on the configuration of the, the merge and weave section. And uh, so the customer made some improvements and wanted to evaluate the effectiveness very quickly of those improvements. And of course, uh, we were able to show very, very uh, significant reductions in the rear end and sideswap related conflicts. Um, lastly, I'll just turn to um, the real-time safety, which is probably for, for AMAG and I think a number, number of other companies also working in this space, a very, very exciting um, uh, bleeding edge technology. And what you see in the, the diagram in the upper left is, is our video analytics detection. Uh, and so if you if you look at that and say look we we can detect 
any road user in any at any position on the road. So we can detect, for example, a pedestrian uh, out jaywalking or a pedestrian that's entered uh, a crosswalk um, illegally, and we can take we can detect that very quickly within uh, two tenths of a second. So we could then use that information to to direct uh, information to a traffic signal uh, city. Uh, who could develop a personality based on that, that configuration and, and aim to protect a stranded pedestrian or a bicyclist that entered an intersection on red. Um, uh, there's a whole variety of use, use cases. Um, we could also just, just monitor for speeding, red light running, wrong way driving, all those sorts of, of um, activities that we'd want to know about at, um, and regarding the operation of, of sites on our network. What you get from knowing that are, are the heat maps you see below. Um, and so we can get, we can generate those heat maps for, for an hour, for a day, a week. Uh, we can filter those heat maps by the, you know, conflicts that involve pedestrians or bicyclists or heavy trucks or anything we want to know. Um, so really the, the diagnostic capability of, of the technology is, um, is really, really powerful, both in real time and retrospectively. Uh, the general architecture of this kind of solution is where we would, we would uh, have cameras at a location. Um, we we uh, run the analytics from those cameras, essentially the video stream through a low latency um, analytics engine, uh, which is for us is a, a, an Edgebox AWS panorama. Uh, from and, and that's very low latency, two, two tenths of a second um, kind of average latency. Uh, and then we can, from that panorama device, talk to a, multi a number of d other devices like um, emergency services, um, uh, traffic signals, uh, et cetera. We can then load the metadata, we do load the metadata up into a cloud environment where we serve it back to the customer. Uh, and then we can send um, low latency messages to a variety of different um, devices to enable real-time safety. And this is the most exciting um, area of growth and interest for a lot of our customers. Uh, we've got several customers now uh, implementing these solutions and wanting to trial these solutions. And um, we, we believe that there's uh, a safer intersection that we can deliver uh, than, than it's ever been possible without the, these kinds of devices before. So really wrapping up here, um, the, the, focus, the focus of um, this technology and, and our company and, and, and numerous other companies that are, that are working in this space is really to change the paradigm shift um, uh, from uh, reactive to, to proactive safety and get ahead of um, our, our risks uh, and mitigate them before, before it's too late and someone's killed or injured. Uh, and this is a transition that the people on this call and myself are the ones that need to implement. There, there is not another room full of people um, or there's not another online forum of participants that are more directly connected to this kind of solution than, than, uh, than the ones, the people that are on this, that are attending this call. Um, and, you know, having been in the road safety uh, um, area for the better part of 30 years, um, the, the, it is our responsibility to, to progress this, this field. And we are in a fortunate position where for the first time, there's serious technology available to enable us to change our focus and do things differently. And, and that's really what, why our company exists is to, to help that transition and to save lives and, and prevent, um, prevent deaths. Um, really, the Olympics is an opportunity to showcase a whole bunch of things, um, including a safe city. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for a city um, and a country to to be able to to show that it the best of what it can offer to to visitors and to its residents and and athletes that attend. Um, so, from my perspective, this this is an opportunity to really improve the, the operation of work zones as we lead up to, for the decade lead up to the, the games. Work zones are a really, really important um, 
to keep safe. And the technology I just shared with you can drastically help in, in the, the delivery of safer work zones. Um, we need to prepare the system for large numbers of unfamiliar active drivers and travelers. How do we understand that and how we understand the risks that, that will, um, these new visitors will pose is going to be very interesting. Um, we need to manage the venues, uh, the transport network at peak capacity. But as I mentioned in the beginning, we're, we're not sure yet if um, how, how at peak all of the, the roads and networks will, will be. Um, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, and uh, another experiment data point in, in the delivery of the of Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, so, I mean, the, it's an opportunity to leave, leave the world with an unforgettably positive impression of Brisbane, Australia. And I hope that we can throw the best of what we have um, to, uh, to the rest of the world to keep them safe, to, to make the, everyone leave um, in the, the happiest state they can, in the, the most satisfied that they, they had a safe, wonderful Olympic Games uh, in one of the most beautiful cities in the world. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to all of you and I appreciate Engineers Australia. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, for your input today. I would now like to welcome our final speaker, Jason Della. With an extensive 32 year background in government, Jason possesses strong engineering and management skills honed through practical knowledge of policy setting, strategic transport planning, road operations, asset management and project management. Having worked in local government across Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria, Jason brings a wealth of experience to AMA. Jason's expertise lies in customer centric project delivery, facilitating collaboration among communities, industries and all government levels supported by his friendly and composed communication style. Please join me in welcoming Jason Della. Uh, Jason Della is my name and I'm going to wrap up today with our session around safety and, and the uh, Brisbane 2023 Olympic Games. And you've heard Simon talk about uh, the, the sort of the background and some of the, the technical aspects of what AMAG does. And so, what I'm going to do is talk about some of the used cases that that uh, we have done and, and how they might be applicable to the Olympic Games and uh, the preparation for them. So I, I expect that uh, we're going to uh, experience an increased volume and, and I think that's pretty obvious. And there's also going to be an expectation of about issues being resolved quickly. There'll be a, a dependence on the existing infrastructure and, and while we would really like new infrastructure being built. I think it's realistic to expect that a lot of the existing network will be in place. So there's going to be a massive impact on, on that infrastructure and, and not only from a vehicle perspective, but from a, an active transport perspective. There'll be a lot of people out of, from out of town that are unfamiliar with moving in and around Brisbane and the surrounds. And we expect that there'll be conflicts. Uh, so how do we manage those conflicts? Is the issue, and this is this is where uh, we've been working on will be incredibly useful for the preparation, but also during the the Olympics while they're on. And so we're basically looking at event management in the the preparation of it and moving forward into it. So I'm going to talk about our our three main products, and I won't dwell on this because Simon's covered some of this already. Um, and essentially, it's it's our looking at uh, conflicts in our smart safety product, but also in the real time operations element. And while we do that, we can collect all sorts of information around speeds and volumes. So the first case study I wanted to talk about was the leading pedestrian intervals that we did in Washington and Bellevue recently. And, and what, the, what the city wanted to understand was the impact of introducing leading pedestrian intervals, let's call them LPI. What we want to do with with our solution is to provide a tool for them to demonstrate the safety benefit that is provided. So there was a number, and I'll, I won't go through the specific sites, but there was a there was a number of sites that were were treated uh, and did before and after this, uh, analysis on them to understand the impact and uh, understanding that they're on the traveling on the different side of the road. So just 
it, it would be a mirror reflection here in Australia, of course. So if we looked at the before and after uh, analysis, you can see the conflicts uh, on, in this heat map, which, which shows the near misses essentially. And you can see the, the conflicts before the treatment and then the conflicts after the treatment. And we can demonstrate that those conflicts have disappeared. And there was a, a reduction of 40% uh, in pedestrians involved in rear engines in conflicts uh, and 30% and reduction. So there, there was a, a clear demonstration of an improvement. Now, if we, we look at how this can be applied for uh, the, the Olympics coming up, then we can understand the conflicts at these intersections. And you'll see through these case studies how they can be applied during the event and running into the event in the planning aspect. So it's not just through while the Olympics are on this preparing for them. We've recently done some work in Southeast Queensland on permissive right turns to, to understand uh, in a similar vein to, to the one I just showed, that what it would mean by controlling that right turn movement through intersections. And you can see by this heat map, this is what the intersection looked like prior to the introduction of the controlled right turn. Uh, the heat map shows where the, the intensity of the near misses is, or was, I should say. Uh, and once the introduction of the treatment occurred, you can see the decrease in those conflicts. And so we can clearly demonstrate the safety benefit of that, that being introduced into that intersection. We uh, also have looked at uh, looking at the continuous flow and speed risks. So the ones we've just shown you are specific examples. We can also look at it in real time. And so we, we can now monitor uh, the locations 24 seven. And so we did this in uh, three Southeast US states where we ran uh, our operational uh, product to understand the ongoing risk. And so it's not just a snapshot. And so we can send alerts then once the, the data is being collected. And therefore we can produce a, a real-time solution for each of the locations in question and determine where things are different. And when we've got a lot of different users using the location, some of them walk on the wrong side of the road to, to the way they, we would hear potentially and, and in the wrong direction, we can start sending alerts and understanding when those things begin to occur. Uh, and using our, our edged enabled solution, we provide this real-time product. This is uh, a snapshot of what that would look like. And you can see uh, this is at night, obviously, but it's real time. Uh, and the, the, the AI provides a, a bulletin, essentially, if, if uh, an alert is received. And those alerts can be configured uh, by the users. This is a snapshot of the, uh, the platform with and inbound alerts uh, of conflicts, it's configurable. And that's that's part of the beauty of what we're, we're offering here. Uh, and the uh, uh, alerts provided by the, the edge. The next case that I'd like to talk about is with roundabouts and bicycles in Southeast Queensland. This was one where there was concern with, with obviously bicycles and how they're navigating this roundabout. And we needed to understand uh, how we could treat that. And so with an increase in volume, which was experienced at these locations, which is what we'll be experiencing when the Olympics are on, where are those pressure points? Uh, and you can see in this before and after analysis uh, with some treatment, with some mind marking treatment, some countermeasures were installed, you can demonstrate what that benefit is. And so at each of the locations where it's anticipated to be an issue, we can work out what that could be and, and action it well before the event occurs. And in this example, 
uh, there was a, a reduction in 77% of bicycle involved conflicts. And so the vulnerable road user countermeasures can be demonstrated. Uh, in another part of the world, we have looked at, uh, this is in uh, Egypt, where we looked at pedestrian risks and understanding when there's lots and lots and lots of pedestrians crossing. And in this example, where we can see a heat map where there are severe pedestrian conflicts. Uh, and so the Delta V is greater than 30 kilometers an hour. And Simon spoke to you about this one. And this is an example of where it really very severe pedestrian conflicts. And so in this location, it can be seen where the issues are and where they are. It's not just the heat maps. We can track the trajectories and so we can tailor solutions to address those trajectories. We know that the conflicts are, are severe and so therefore we would expect that that would lead to uh, crashes uh, and incidents. And so now we can tailor our solution and, and be prepared for where that occurs. Now, if we go back to the operational element, we can do this in real time as well. So it's not only before the event, but it's during the event where we can track these, these issues. Uh, similarly to the, the bicycles that I spoke about before, uh, recently where we've worked on a, a shared path. And so it's not just about the roads. We're also looking at uh, off roads, essentially, uh, which we would expect to see uh, at, at leading into the Olympics. And we can see, we can generate heat maps of of where the conflicts are and in this example around the bend you can see those conflicts and not only that we can identify the trajectory of those users and uh, we can understand them at, at different levels it's not just uh, a pedestrian we can separate out the, uh, the walkers to the cyclists to the e-scooters and uh, understand the the different speeds between them and i think this is this is a really interesting element when we start looking at countermeasures, um, understanding what that speed difference is and and the where, where we can address that or even how we can address that. One of the, uh, the, the big elements that we expect, which will be, there'll, there'll be a lot of uh, public transport. And so understanding it's not just about cars, it's not just about the vulnerable users, it's also about uh, the public transport. And so the case study here, we looked at uh, buses uh, as a specific uh, user a type, uh, a road use type through this transit corridor and under and to work out the, the crash risk along that bus route. We used uh, uh, the smart safety product to determine where the, the and as you can see with these uh, maps that they, they aren't across the whole intersection or it could be along a, a, a length of road. It doesn't have to be at an intersection. And, and then now we can target those areas for treatment and, and understand where the key elements are so along specific paths. And so we can be strategic and, and surgical in how we address that. The next case study uh, is is looking at uh, roundabout and understanding uh, the impact of payment markings and a lane keeping and and which is not too dissimilar to that shared path, but obviously on a roundabout with vehicles. Uh, understanding that uh, through through this treatment uh, with vehicles tracking knowing where that, those movements are uh, can become powerful when we are looking for uh, line marking treatment in this case. And so you can see here with the, the heat maps where the existing conflicts were. And after the treatment was done, you can see the reduction. Now, you can see it hasn't removed them all. And so there might need to be another treatment. Now, what has happened we can show the treatment that was applied what reduction occurred and so 
uh, each location is unique uh, and and can be analysed using uh, the the techniques that AMAG have provided here. So you could see from the heat map there was a, a change with the countermeasure introduced. And in this slide, you can see the conflict rate per thousand units uh, users, I should say, uh, was improved by, uh, well, there was a difference of 72%. Uh, and, it, uh, and with the conflict count, it was uh, reduced by 71%. So um, the savings before and after in, in the crashes was, uh, well, the conflicts was uh, quite significant. Uh, the next uh, case study uh, is a higher speed uh, environment involving uh, a motorway scenario uh, in the US. And there was a history of side swipes at the mergers. And uh, so the, they wanted to understand what would happen with the introduction of some countermeasures. And the reason that this is an interesting case study is that it's not just low speed, it, it can be for the high speed monitoring environment. And I would expect that as we approach the Olympics, that there will be a need to get users between venues. I'm not gonna say rapidly, but certainly uh, at an appropriate speed and, and that we wanna make sure that they flow. And so we can monitor that in real time and uh, understand the conflicts uh, as they are occurring. And so in these environments, uh, the, the issues were uh, with the, the mergers, with rear ends. And uh, so you can see in the examples, uh, the treatment that was introduced with the, the higher uh, length of the merge treatment was introduced. And to understand what that looked like, the before and after indicated the, the reduction in the conflicts at those locations. With uh, a 5% reduction in, in rear ends and uh, a greater reduction of 35% with the, the side swipes. And so we, we can see that it's the 5% the is still 5% of an, an improvement. And so the, the finding was, was such that uh, there's confidence in that treatment being, being utilized. The next case study is the looking at the pedestrians uh, walking and the delayed end of walk signal at uh, Bellevue in, in the United States. And what they were interested in was uh, the risk of, of those pedestrians uh, taking a while to cross or longer than that they would expect. And so if, for example, there was an elderly pedestrian or, or someone that had mobility issues that was, wasn't going to get to the road in time, then in real time, we can send a signal to those controls to hold the red signal back to allow that pedestrian to cross. And so the application for that is, is quite significant. And you can expect that with uh, uh, an increase of users that are not familiar necessarily with where they're going, um, that this could become quite quite a useful uh, way to analyze the, the locations and perhaps mo monitor it while the event's on and if there are issues there, then to, to address them. And so with the, uh, the identification of the pedestrians in almost real time, of oh, one of a second, excuse me, uh, and in monitoring the pedestrians in almost real time, this, this allows us a lot more control in able to uh, address any issues that they're occurring. It, it can also include uh, situations where you've got a, a mass of pedestrians uh, congregating uh, and the signal has inact been activated. We can get to a point where that signal can be generated by the detection of those pedestrians uh, to allow a faster movement of that phase. Uh, and as we get close to the end, the the one of the, well, I can't not put in one where we we do collect um, speeds and and uh, the different assessments of those speeds uh, through all the data that we collect. 
And so it's not just about conflicts, it's about this rich picture of information that can be used for decision makers before an event, during the event. And, and th this can be done uh, in real time. And the dashboard here shows an example of uh, 15, 25th, 50th, 85th, and 95th percentile speeds. Everyone loves a good box plot. And, and so th this provides a, a rich information tool for, uh, for those that are accessing the platform. And so the case studies that I've just shown you today uh, allow for real time alerts and, and processing of information uh, beforehand. Uh, and, it, and it will allow those that are in those positions to make decisions, uh, the ability to make shall we say, better decisions based on, on that information. Uh, it can be a, a wealth of information for all users, not just vehicles, but more importantly, uh, the vulnerable road users that are potentially going to be unfamiliar with movements in and around Brisbane. And to that extent, there'll be facilities that may not have experienced the volume that they have previously. So we can work out what that might mean. Uh, but then, like with all events, there's things that happen uh, during the event that we need to respond to quickly. And we now have the tools to be able to do that. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Well, now it's you, our audience's turn to get involved. So please ask our speakers your questions by the chat box. And don't forget to include who your question is directed to. A uh, big thank you to everyone who did submit questions while registering for the webinar today. So this is some of those questions. Andrew, I will ask you the first question, bring him to the discussion. Um, now, this question came through from Keith, who's based here in Queensland. And his question was, what challenges do you envisage in hosting games events on the Sunshine Coast compared to the Gold Coast, given no direct heavy rail link from Brisbane and no mid-tier transit like the Gold Coast light rail? So, Andrew. Thanks, uh, thanks, Meg, and thanks, Keith, uh, for the question. So, uh, well, first of all, I can't, I can't speak directly on behalf of TMR, who obviously are going through the full transport planning for uh, South East Queensland and the Olympics. But um, it, it is correct that uh, so for the um, transport services for the Gold Coast include uh, commuter rail, uh, whereas the uh, Coast isn't directly served to the same level on the rail side. So there will be more reliance on the performance of the motorways in that case. In that regard, the uh, smart motorway solutions is one possible is one possible strategy to utilise there on the uh, Bruce Highway. Uh, also, um, looking at things like uh, what was learnt from the Commonwealth Games when they were hosted on the Gold Coast uh, in 2018. Um, gave some good insight into how motorways can be managed in such ways to minimise uh, congestion, for example, by dropping speed limits across the length of the motorway. So there were some good learnings that came from that experience, which I think may be able to be applied uh, effectively in the 2032 games as well. The key, I think a key consideration will be how to maximise the, uh, the performance of the motorways uh, between Brisbane, Sunshine Coast, and also Gold Coast. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Simon, I've got a question for for you, and it's come through from Raj, and it is, uh, what type of software and hardware are used to tackle real-time monitoring and management? Um, great question. Um, so, you know, there, there are a bunch of varieties uh, um, out there, and and it's a very rapidly growing area, particularly the edge computing space. So um, we we are now seeing uh, a lot of 
investment and interested in uh, you know putting computers in the field uh, in the edge devices and doing heavy lifting uh, on the edge and then transferring that information just um, this sort of the metadata from from the field to uh, say cloud environments or on-prem uh, environments so um, it, it's sort of we're seeing the evolution in that technology that we saw say 20 years ago in, in cameras and so um, you know the the CPU GPU uh, heavy lift that that we're seeing uh, on the, the development of, of um, on on edge devices is, is quite quite uh, amazing to watch and so I think what we're going to see going forward is um, a real real huge improvements in the amount of analytics that we can support on the edge uh, and the heavy lifting that we can do on the edge and then you know send that information to servers and or cloud environments that are that are that a lot of customers are now uh, migrating towards Thanks, Simon um, I have a question come through from Daniel um, which it was directed to to Andrew um, and it is how mature is the smart city technology? And um, how uh, I suppose how it will be protected from from hackers. Yep, uh, good question. So the maturity, in the sense of, uh, I, I might I might uh, maybe flip that around to some extent. Maturity gives the impression that some something needs to have uh, been developed or produced over time. And develops maturity over time whereas it's with software it's more of a case of are you leveraging the, the most uh, I guess the most effective and relevant technology to be able to achieve the outcomes that you're, you're attempting to achieve and and making use of new technologies as they become available so it's a, it's the maturity of the approach to be using quite quite new technology but um, it the, the new technology is is more capable of achieving the outcomes that we're looking to achieve with the technology. So the approach that's used is where the maturity needs to sit in, and, and that that's really the key the key focus more so than the maturity of the technology. And in fact, there's risk with legacy technology. So so technology that's been around since um, the early two thousands or even earlier than nineteen nineties are inherently risky when it comes to security. So they'll develop at a time when that wasn't a major concern. So moving forward at this point in time, uh, um, software development, uh, providing, uh, you know, developing new solutions for ITS, for example, things like security can be built in from the very beginning. So utilizing tools and techniques and approaches that are really forward looking in terms of the security threat. So that's where the the maturity comes in with the maturity of the approach, being aware of the threats, being aware of how to how to control and mitigate those, and how to build secure software in the current environment is very important. Excellent, so, thank you. Thanks, Mick. Well, what I might do is bring in a couple of the live questions that we've had come through. So, a big thank you to everyone watching live. Um, a question came through from Belinda Walker, and I might direct this one to, to you, Jason. I'll, I'll bring you back into the conversation. Um, and her question was, for critical conflicts predicting crashes, is there any research on how this is impacted by roadside advertising? Roadside advertising is a really interesting uh, case. It's, there, is, there is research done around that. Uh, and continues to do so. And and uh, one of the things that we are currently working on at the moment is uh, using our research, our, our tools, I should say, to to understand the safety impacts on advertising uh, and, and specifically dwell times. And so that's a body of work that we're, we're, we're currently undertaking. I can't say too much more about that at the moment, but it's, it's an evolution of understanding that with, with the, the research uh, and our tools as, as we're developing them. So it's it's a really interesting question and, and it's one that we get asked a lot and and I certainly know over the years it's one that keeps popping up. So uh, 
I, I think over the next a little period, shall we say, that there will be a better understanding around advertising and the impact on on uh, road safety. Thanks, Jason. Um, Simon, I've got a question for you. It's come from Ahmad, um, and it is active transport and pedestrian projects tend to be treated as the little cousins of large road infrastructure projects. However, they present far greater micro challenges and usually have an adverse impact on pedestrian traffic and general traffic, which governments tend to not tolerate. At the same time, this is a very long question, forgive me. At the same time, the benefits of improving active transport and, and pedestrian connections present far greater benefits to cities. Is a mindset change required in our leaders in accepting some impact to traffic for the betterment of active transport and what walkability? Well, uh, it's a fantastic question and, and I think it's a very uh, contemporary question because uh, when I when I think about the customers that we have taken on across six countries, without exception, the focus on, of uh, a big focus of many of those customers is on the safety of, of active travelers, and and so I think uh, um, a mindset shift is already underway. Uh, I, I think we have a long way to go, um, and I think the points in the made in the question about uh, sort of the the uh, the cousin or or or, or the re reference to it being uh, an afterthought or, or or not the primary driver of, of pro project delivery um, is, is one that is is starting to change and 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 uh, but I do think we have work work ahead of us to go further but but it is important and uh, and I completely agree with that and and I always tell or ask people when we have these discussions around active travelers is when, when you think about your favorite cities uh, that we visited, most people will, will, will think about cities where active travel is, is really ubiquitous. And, um, and so it's something we, we need to aspire to and build systems that, that deliver that, that outcome. Well, thank you. Megan, can I just uh, add to that, if you don't mind? Of course. Yeah, I, I, just to follow on from what Simon said, uh, I, I've spent a, a lot of time in, in government and I understand that there, there can be a perception for those that haven't been in government that it's a forgotten element, the, the pedestrians and, and active transport. Uh, in my experience, it, it's not forgotten. It's, it's, it's certainly something that is considered and well considered. It's just challenging because of the the interplay and that they are vulnerable users and so it's something that certainly i've seen where there is that focus it's an ongoing focus um and it's really important and, and as we move through towards the olympics uh, i think you'll you'll see and certainly I, I would like to think that the community will see that that uh, pedestrians and active transport is just as important as the vehicles Thanks, Jason. Uh, Andrew, I've got a question for you, and it's from um, someone watching from New South Wales. And their question was whether the smart traffic solutions are recognised for their reduction in greenhouse gases and gains in, in, and gains in productivity by reducing travel time. Yep, thanks. Thanks, Mick. So, Yes, uh, the, the short answer to the question is yes. It, it does depend upon um, uh, the, the reduction in travel time is, is generally a strong driver, travel time and performance in terms of understanding the improvements that have been um, delivered by smart motorway solutions. So typically what will happen is customer, like the road agency will run a baseline of measurement for about three months prior to the system going live and then that baseline then forms the ability to to measure the improvements and that's why we are able to get some fairly specific improvements shown in terms of improved travel time the travel time improvements typically will happen during periods of peak congestion because uh, you know, if there's no congestion the uh, you know the smart motorways can't, won't be able to optimize any further than what um, what the uh, the uh, motorway performance would be at that time. But what we're looking for is 
reducing the time that the peak congestion occurs. So uh, improving travel time up until that, that peak congestion period happens and, and then after it as well. So what, what you might see is that you still may have congestion occurring, but it will be for a shorter period of time during that, that um, during what's, what's normally a lengthy period of, of very severe congestion. And so overall, the average travel time, therefore, is improved during that period of congestion. There may be some, uh, there may be some times during the peak of the congestion where it may only be marginally improved, but overall, the average travel time can be improved. And, th and that's measured from the baseline. Things like, uh, in terms of sustainability, so greenhouse gas emissions typically would have would then be calculated based off various assumptions around the, um, the types of vehicles that are on the road, uh, the general performance of those vehicles under different conditions, and then using things like uh, the improved travel time, uh, the improved flow, being able to then calculate uh, based off uh, certain sets of assumptions what the overall improved efficiency would then have been of the vehicles on the motorway uh, across across a period of time and get in from that being able to derive what the, the overall savings would have been in terms of better fuel economy for a number of vehicles over, over, over a significant period of time and that's how that's how the greenhouse gas uh, emission savings are calculated thanks Andrew um, Simon, I had a question come through live, Namal, who's watching, so big hello to Namal. His question was, what are the inputs data you use to predict future crashes? Um, so uh, essentially the inputs are uh, at this stage uh, either LiDAR uh, sensor inputs or video sensor inputs. So uh, we, we tap into existing camera infrastructure and process uh, PTZ, PTZ cameras or um, uh, other special purpose cameras that are at, at transport network locations, or we work with our partners to, to install uh, temporary uh, video cameras to, to monitor sites. Uh, so for our continuous product, we need permanently installed cameras. Uh, for the safety where we do it typically a one week deep dive, we can use either permanent or temporary cameras. Uh, and then we, we are working with several LiDAR companies out of the US uh, to process LiDAR information, 3D point cloud information, because we do see that as uh, a, a pathway to um, a dual sensor solution where we have the best of video and the best of LiDAR. Um, delivering close to 100% accuracy on, on, on all of road users. Um, that's a little way in the future, but it, but it's it's on it's a, it's a, we're on that journey at the moment. Um, thank you, Jason. I've got a question for you. It's what unintended consequences do you expect from the movement of people and competitors? I think that there's. It's easy to uh, plan and and work on the movement of of people going to watch the games essentially, you know, and and, and the focus being all about the games and and the the fact that the events are are geographically separate. So what I've seen and we've seen and, and experienced and and had some discussions with some of the the local governments. Uh, in that area is that it, there's potentially going to be a, a side impact for for those areas where it's not necessarily the games themselves or movement in and amongst the games or to the events. It's it's a change in patterns. And Simon mentioned this earlier around non-normal travel where certain routes and certain areas may have a, a, a weird change in travel patterns. And for for the period leading into the games and, and during the games, there, there could be some, uh, <laughs> I was going to say crazy changes, but it, it, it'll be not what they expect. And so th there's there's a level of planning that I think needs and will go into the unintended outcome of that movement. And it, it certainly wouldn't be the intent to, to make things worse in those local areas, but 
there is a potential for a change and 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 you will see that some people will decide not to go to an event and and go to a local area instead and, and visit that local area and so there there'll be those impacts that need to be managed and so the the management of of the event isn't just those direct lines of of uh of travel patterns to the events it's it's the ancillary events and and in the local areas that will also need a, a lot of consideration Awesome, thank you and i know simon you spoke a little bit about the the games in atlanta um during your presentation and and you know what they went through so it'd be interesting um from and i think that was one of the questions it's like you know what have we learned from hosting other olympics um well you know just just going into um a little more detail uh you know we we um we expected that and, and and we worked with the georgia department of transportation to to try to understand what what the changes in demand travel demand would be and and uh to measure measure the impact of the olympic games um it, it, it's actually quite challenging to do um, um because at the at the time and this is going back to 1996 um there, there were very very few um, methods, uh, and there probably still are, for collecting, for example, knowing who's on the road at any given time. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, some of the, the visit, visiting, um, you know, mode shift choices, for example, these, these uh, temporary services that will deliver people to, to venues, those are obvious, but there's, but what a lot less obvious are who's, who's got rental cars and and who are teaming up with local residents to, to and, and uh, you know driving their vehicles and things like that. Um, and as I said, the, the forecasts were all that that the, there would be gridlock everywhere, and uh, to everyone's surprise, that the demand forecasting was was quite was quite off. And uh, and so understanding how people behave, um, the the one lesson that I, that we all took away from that was that understanding how people behave in an extreme event. Is, is a lot more difficult in understanding how people behave on a daily basis. And so people can change their travel behavior and their, uh, on a sh for a short-term period very drastically, um, but it's much harder to change your travel behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. So that was really the, the impact that take away for all of us uh, during those games. Excellent, thank you. Look, we're, we've kind of come to the end of our time today. Um, I do have one last question. Hopefully it won't be too much of a, a long one for us. Um, it came through from Thomas Kenny and to you, it was around um, what levels of accuracy are guaranteed by the technologies, by each of the technologies? Um, I, I can... Uh, okay, so I'll take a crack at at, at us. Um, so we, we we shy away from the the word guarantee because um, w our experience is that um, w w there are certain things that we can't control. For example, at at a site level, so we we can't control some of the obstructions that might be uh, in front of a camera, uh, and and so and and there are often limitations on where cameras can be placed. So. Um, almost every site has has um, some minor uh, obstruction or limitation that will have an impact on the analytics. So what we do say, though, is that we strive um, uh, to achieve 90% accuracy across all of our, our classifications. And um, I would say nine times out of 10, uh, at nine, nine times out of 10 sites, we're able to deliver and exceed that, that, that goal. But we may have one turning movement, for example, that, that doesn't achieve that or um, uh, because of some obstruction or something like that. So the, the expectation is should, should be above 90%. Thank you. Well, look, that's all the time that we've had for today. So please join me in once again thanking our speakers, Andrew Painter, Simon Washington and Jason Diller for their time and input today. I'd also like to thank our industry partners, AMAG, Arab, Oricon, Bluebeam, GHD, and SMEC for their support. 
And finally, if I could please ask if you could complete the short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below. Um, if you do complete that, it, it really does help us to improve and plan our future sessions. So uh, thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you at our next Thought Leaders event. Good afternoon.